you might have a kiddish cup like my kiddish cup at home. And maybe it's languishing on your dining room shelf gathering dust, or maybe you use it every week. But even if you use it every week, how long has it been to, since you really paid attention to it? Paying attention to the material world around us is a big part of my day job as an architect. I'm always asking, why does this look the way it does? What was the designer intending to communicate? Could it look any different than it does? And paying attention to the kinds of stories objects can tell us is a big part of my other day job as a museum exhibition designer. There, the questions are, how can I elicit a great story from this artifact from long ago and far away? So when I began becoming more Jewishly observant almost 30 years ago, I started to turn that paying attention to the Jewish ritual objects that we use all the time. The menorahs, the Seder plates, and yes, the Kiddush cups. I started asking questions about what their function was. What do they really do for us and what can they help us do? And I realized that they have many jobs to do. First of all, a kiddush cup needs to hold at least 3.9 ounces of liquid, usually grape liquid. And being Jews, the rabbis of the Talmud debated endlessly about 3.9 versus 3.5 versus 5 ounces. But it has to hold a certain amount of grape liquid to serve us Friday nights. So first and foremost, there are certain halachic conditions or parameters, what I like to think of as the design specifications outlined in the Talmud, that an object has to fulfill in order to be fit for use or kosher. So this cup does that quite nicely. Secondly, my cup tells a very personal Jewish story. It was a gift to me from my late mother-in-law who had been given it by her grandmother in the 1930s in Germany. When I hold it in my hand on Friday nights, its patina reminds me of the generations of hands that have held it and connects me with my past in a very personal way. It's very worn in spots, and every ding and nick in its surface can tell stories about treacherous journeys and narrow escapes from Nazi Germany. So it connects me very directly to my past. And sometimes these remnants that become heirlooms are the only thing we have left of a world that's lost to us. Thirdly, it's quite a lovely cup. And in that sense, fulfills a core Jewish value of hidur mitzvah, or beautifying the mitzvah. The rabbis of the Gemara tell us to make a beautiful sukkah, a beautiful tallit with beautiful fringes, use beautiful calligraphy in, in inscribing a Torah. They are acutely aware of the central role aesthetic pleasure plays in honoring God. So even though my cup is pretty good at those three jobs, I feel it falls somewhat short in being a tool for spiritual engagement. What do I mean by tool? A tool is something that extends our capacity to do something that our minds and our bodies cannot do by themselves. So if I want to join two pieces of wood, my fist is not capable of hammering in a nail. So I need a hammer, which extends my capacity to get the task done. So what might the task be for our kiddush cups? Rabbi Dean Steinsaltz tells us that the task is to halt us in our tracks to stop us from our routines and habits that endlessly pull us into the mechanical and meaninglessness of aspects of everyday life, to halt us and to then redirect us to a higher world that's accessible to us through these ritual moments. Another way of thinking about this might be an alternative translation of Hidur Mitzvah that I just mentioned. The first century translator of the Torah from Hebrew into Aramaic, a Roman named Ankelos, translated Hidur Mitzvah not as beautifying the commandment, but as inhabiting the commandment. I really love this translation because to me the idea of inhabiting and excavating opens up a world of richness in interpretation for our Jewish rituals and their accompanying objects. So I'd like to share with you my attempt to excavate the mitzvah in the form of a kiddush cup that I designed. The act of making kiddush is essentially an act of separation. 
The moment of Kiddush is the moment where we mark the transition from the secular time of the week to the sacred time of Shabbat. So this is a cup about separation. The weekly part is a heavy mahogany block. It's earthy and even a little clunky. During the week, it holds the Shabbat part, a hammered silver cup, and at that moment of making Kiddush, you separate the cup and hold it in your right hand with five upturned fingers. The five fingers recall the five-petaled rose, which is a Kabbalistic symbol of the Jewish people. So as well as articulating the act of separation, you're connecting yourself with the community of Israel engaged in that same act at that same moment. But our tradition teaches us that the sacred and the profane are not entirely distinct from each other. So during the week, when the cup nestles in its home, I flared the lip of the cup so that the ambient light of the room actually causes the Shabbat section to cast a glow onto the weekly wooden part, thereby infusing the quotidian with a sort of little glow of Shabbat to come. Another object that I've designed, which is rich with this possibility of excavating meaning and really communicating through design the intent to communicate something about these sacred acts. If we think of the Passover Seder as a kind of family drama around the dinner table with the Haggadah as our script, we are charged not to be actors in that drama, but to really see and feel our way into the story of the Exodus. And the Seder plate is the main prop on our tables that can help us do that. When I first started the design of this Seder plate, I looked carefully at the ritual foods that it was supposed to support and realized that it's not a plate at all, but really a kind of symbolic landscape. I realized that the six ritual foods that go on it divided into two groups. Three represent slavery and three represent freedom. Yet I had never seen a Seder plate design that articulated that difference, helping to drive the story forward, acting as a really helpful prop. So my Seder plate separates those slavery foods, the moror, bitter herb, hazeret, the other bitter herb, and the haroset into a heavy limestone slab that's carved to receive each of these foods. When you set the Seder plate, you have to trowel in the haroset into a brick-shaped hollow, thereby with your very action of your body enacting an echo of the slave labor of the uh, Israelites in Egypt as slaves to Pharaoh. The other part of the plate contains the freedom foods, the elevated offering, which is lifted up on a little altar, the egg nestles in its hole, and a springtime orchard of parsley. Here too, like the haroset, the very act of setting the Seder plate means you're planting a little orchard of springtime green, thereby reminding us of the root symbolism of this particular food. Separating the slave foods from the freedom foods is a channel of salt water, which many people now include on their Seder plates, here representing the Red Sea. So in pointing to the Seder plate at that moment of high drama during the evening, you can really tell the whole story of the passage from slavery to freedom through the aid of this plate. Now you might say, it's nice to spend a lot of energy and time thinking about these sort of accessories to Jewish ritual. But really, our deepest meaning, our Jewish tradition has always had its deepest meaning embedded in our texts. After all, we're the people of the book, not the people of the Kiddush cup. But I'd like to argue that we are deeply the people of the Kiddush cup, and that if we recognize that, it opens up a world of opportunities for engagement. First of all, Jewish ritual objects or tools are transdenominational. So there's no such thing as an orthodox Kiddush cup or a reform Seder plate or a conservative mezuzah. So they're open and accessible to people who often have trouble talking to each other through their interpretive texts, which always have embodied in them a certain theology, a certain religious perspective. So they're really a way that the community can come together. Similarly, there's no such thing as a beginner's Kiddush cup or an advanced Seder plate. So they're really open to people of all levels of knowledge and Jewish commitment and learning. Again, a sort of maximal community rather than uh, a minimal. And third, not everybody likes to learn textually. 
These are open to visual learners. Maybe you're someone who learns best with their body, kinesthetically, through performance. So they're open to you as well. At the end of the day, it's really hard to keep ritual acts fresh and compelling to us. So I'd like to suggest that these are our helpers and we should really engage with them. We should demand that they have enough interpretive integrity to help us truly become tools for spiritual engagement.